Hi folks, welcome back. Now in the last lecture I talked about words, how to find the right words to use for any occasion. Remember words are basically the smallest unit we can talk about and we start to talk about style. So if you haven't seen that lecture, go back and watch that one first, because in this lecture we'll be talking about sentences. Now first let's uh, offer up a definition of what we mean by the word sentence. And that is, uh, if you look in most books or dictionaries, you'll see something like this, a complete thought. A little bit ambiguous perhaps, uh, what exactly do they mean by thought? Uh, what do they mean by complete? Um, so another more technical definition is it's anything that has a subject in it and a verb in it. And the, make this even more confusing, the subject doesn't even need to be in the sentence. You have what's called the understood you. So I like to think about these cave dwellers, uh, early proto-humans, they're out in the, in the jungles or wherever, and they need some way to communicate with each other. And probably the first sort of uh, language use that came about was to tell people what to do, right? So, so the big chief can give orders. And so that's why the shortest uh, sentences the, um, are considered imperative. Uh, that is uh, commands. So for example, this is a complete thought. Run! <laughs> Exclamation point. Uh, that's just one word and the subject is the understood you, but it gets the point across. And it's probably kind of important that for, to these uh, cave dwellers that they were able to communicate uh, that sort of information quickly and efficiently. And then later on, uh, as things got more complicated, of course, then you started to get these uh, different kinds of subjects. Uh, so you could say things like, uh, th the mountain lion is coming, uh, run, give you a little bit more detail, but uh, that's sort of a nice segue into what we're talking about here today, right? The, how to make things uh, more complicated, uh, but not more confusing. Okay, so most writers will tell you that the shorter sentences are the ones that are the more, not only are they easier to understand, but they also can pack more of a punch, especially if you use them well in your paragraphs. So the shortest verse in the Bible, for example, is simply two words, Jesus wept. Now, this is unusual if you've uh, read the Bible because you know there's very few really short verses like this. So when you see this, you see it's only two words, all, already it sort of grabs your attention, right? Why is it so short? And then when you start to think about the concept that's being expressed there, you have this divine being, the son of God and so on, uh, who's showing a very human emotion. He's crying weeping. Uh, so there's a reason why they wanted to, the authors of the Bible wanted to keep that short and sweet because it preserves that uh, really uh, attention grabbing moment, uh, this really provocative and uh, profound moment. It wouldn't have the same impact if you put this in the, in the midst of a huge sentence with lots of other verses. Um, it makes a lot of sense just to have it short. Um, now here's an example of a, another short sentence that's used well. And I, I got the uh, first part of the paragraph here so you can see how it has an impact. This is uh, George Orwell uh, wrote a book called Animal Farm in uh, 1984. Uh, this passage is from Animal Farm. So it goes something like this. And finally there was a tremendous baying of dogs and a shrill crowing from the black cockerel. And out came Napoleon himself majestically upright, casting haughty glances from side to side, and with his dogs gambling around him. He carried a whip in his trotter." So you see we go from those sort of long, elegant sentences with lots of, uh, uh, lots of elements to just that short sentence, uh, he carried a whip in his trotter. Because uh, that's a really shocking moment in the narrative, and uh, George Orwell is a really good stylist, so he knew uh, to go from the long sentences to the short one when he wanted to make that really poignant uh, point there. So that's uh, short sentences. Let's talk about long sentences. Now a long sentence, a lot of teachers will advise you just to stay away from them. Uh, they can make things really awkward, uh, very confusing really quickly. Uh, so the longer the sentence, the more attention you have to pay to the way you've put it together. The structure is, is very important. So here's an example of a longer sentence. Uh, so you, you can think about a sentence uh, starting with a kernel. So what's the main idea of the sentence? Uh, this one here is they watched TV. So we're going to take that little kernel and we're going to start adding stuff onto it to make a longer sentence. And we're going to do that with something called free modifiers. Uh, the free modifiers are just little elements that can freely move around. You can shift these things around to different parts of the sentence and it won't uh, affect the meaning of it. 
Uh, we'll see what, why that's important in a minute. Uh, but anyway, here's the, the example. They watched TV. The man staring intently, cradling his bloody fist. His wife glancing idly from, screen, from the screen to the broken window. Both of them secretly wanting to turn off the set and discuss their son's decision to marry Paul. So you see that sentence has a certain resonance to it as hopefully as I was reading that you could sort of feel the tension building up. You know, there's something going on. You got these sort of thoughts that are um, all in the sentence together, but it's not confusing uh, because we've used the free modifiers to add them on. And plus we've kept the structures uh, fairly simple within those elements. Now here's an example of what not to do. Uh, instead of using a free modifier, which means that uh, we can exchange those elements anywhere we want, uh, we're going to use what's called a train. Uh, so these, at the end of each element, uh, the next element will pick up where that one left off. And you'll see it quickly leads to this maze of confusion. So consider this example if you can. The boy sat down to write, retrieving a pen from his bag, which his grandmother had given him for Christmas, which had been a really disappointing holiday that had not been worth the cost of the plane ticket, which was considerable given his lack of money, a problem brought about by losing his job at the camera store, which he had enjoyed because of his keen interest in photography. So, complete mess here, right? It's because the uh, way that they put this together, um, each element is just a train of thought just going from one to the next without a clear connection. There's not a relationship to the rest of the uh, sentence, so it's very confusing. So if you want to add some length to your sentences, uh, there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, we'll get into different sentence types in a moment, but uh, these are just simple things. Uh, one is you can add some descriptive phrases in the mix. So we could have, uh, and we'll, we'll compare this to a clause, uh, which remembers the, uh, it's got a subject and a verb in it. So here's a clause, the dog who hungered for its supper. So you see that part, uh, who hungered for its supper is the clause. We can change that into a phrase. The dog, hungry for its supper, comma, and see that would let us put on a few more of those if we wanted to, or it would make it easier to make a longer sentence. Too many clauses will make something confusing. So here's another example. The scout was lost in the forest, so he climbed a tree. Uh, if we wanted to make that longer, uh, we could say lost in the forest, the scout climbed a tree, and then that would leave us uh, some room there to put some more stuff in. It wouldn't get confusing. I just put a period there though. Okay, then um, some more examples of this is uh, to add the participial phrase. Uh, so remember those are the ones, you take any verb you want. Uh, let's take uh, a Wonder Woman flies in her airplane. And uh, instead of using flies as a verb, we'll just put ing or ed on it and make it into an adjective instead. Um, so Wonder Woman, comma, flying in her plane, or Wonder Woman having just flown in from Alaska or wherever, uh, so here's another example of a, about a boxer. And I got the participial phrases there in italics. So the boxer sized up his opponent, peering into his determined eyes, scanning the muscles of his arms and legs, scrutinizing his balance and position on the mat, calculating his odds for a quick knockout. So again, you see how those participial, uh, participial phrases, they're building up a certain tension that you can literally uh, have a, a punchline there at the end. A second example, these sloppily packaged parcels still lay on the doorstep, unaddressed, unopened, still unnoticed by its would-be victim. So you got some nice uh, structures there with the unaddressed, unopened, unnoticed. So when you repeat little elements like that, it, it makes it seem a little bit more uh, elegant, uh, but it also makes it more attractive, I think. Uh, even easier to comprehend and you get a little bit more emotional uh, effect that way as well. Now here's some other examples of this. The speaker paused, allowing tension to build, hoping her audience would never forget what she was about to say. Second example, the fencer fought with skill and precision, swinging his rapier one moment, stabbing the next, timing each strike for maximum effect. So hopefully you're starting to hear, right, uh, these sort of rhythms, these sort of cadences that we've got going here, and we're using those uh, verbals uh, the swinging, stabbing, timing, and keeping those structures uh, very even, uh, very similar to each other, so we don't get awkward or confusing. So here's what, one of my favorite examples. Suddenly, Mr. Jones felt a pain in his chest, a pain that grew stronger with each second, spreading first to his left arm, then to his right. 
Up his back it thundered, finally squeezing into his neck. He struggled to breathe, broke into sweat, felt the floor shifting under his feet. He became absolutely terrified, and then he was dead. So that's almost the whole story just in one sentence. But it's not, is that sentence confusing? No. Is it awkward? No. And the reason that is, is because we paid very careful attention to how we've put it together. Uh, we used lots of uh, verbals, uh, spreading, struggled, broke, we kept it all grammatically parallel. And we really uh, worked on the balance and we read it out loud many times to make sure uh, that it sounded well. And you can do this too, it makes for very powerful prose. Okay, so uh, now let's get into the more technical stuff about these different sentence types. Um, there's basically four types of sentences that you need to know about. Uh, the simple sentence, the compound, the complex, and the compound complex. So the simple sentences uh, have one independent clause and there's no dependent clauses. That's why they're simple. So the, here's a couple of examples. The road to hell is paved with adverbs. Uh, some, uh, Stephen King got the subject there, the road. Uh, the uh, verb is, is paved. In the second example, to gain your own voice, you have to forget about having it heard. Uh, that's Allen Ginsberg. Now, uh, the to gain your own voice there is, a, is the, uh, in, it's the infinitive uh, phrase there. There's no subject to it. But the subject of the main part there is you, and then the verb is have to forget or have forget. Okay, now we get into compounds, and these will be two independent clauses, but there's still no dependent clause. So basically, you just take a couple of simple sentences and put them into the same sentence. So here's an example from Samuel Johnson, who wrote the first dictionary. The greatest part of a writer's time is spent in reading. In order to write, a man will turn over half a library to make one book. So the, one of those clauses there is the uh, greatest part of a writer's time is spent in reading. And the other clause is a man will turn over half a library to make one book. You have two independent clauses, so that makes a compound. Second example, Jack Kerouac, great beatnik writer. One day I will find the right words, and they will be simple. So they will be simple, and one day I will find the right words. All right, now we get into complex sentences. These are the ones that have at least one, well, they have, you know, back up. So they got at least one independent, and then at least uh, one Shoot, I still didn't say that right. Okay, only one independent clause and at least one dependent clause. Whew, making this way more complex than it has to be. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Uh, this one's from Henry David Thoreau who wrote Walden. How vain it is to sit down to write when you have not stood up to live. So the blue part there is the dependent clause. When you have not stood up to live, that's not a complete sentence, right? It's not a complete thought, so that makes it dependent. It's a clause, though, because you have a subject in it, you, and a, a verb, have not stood. Second example, Joyce uh, Carol Oates. The first sentence can't be written until the final sentence is written. Interesting thought there. But you see, uh, until the final sentence is written, is written. Uh, that's a, another clause because it has a subject, uh, the final sentence, and the verb is. So now we get to my favorite example, the compound complex. Now this might sound a bit intimidating, but it's really not. Uh, all we do is just take, it's sort of a combination of the compound sentence with a dependent clause thrown in. So you gotta have at least two independent clauses and then at least one uh, dependent clause. So here's some examples. First one, J.D. Salinger, uh, who wrote uh, one, oh, uh, The Catcher in the Rye. What really knocks me out is a book that when you're all done reading it, you wish the author who wrote it was a terrific friend of yours, and you could just and you could call him up on the phone whenever you felt like it. Great sentiment there. You could see all of the uh, stuff going on there. Uh, the what really knocks me out, that's a dependent clause. Um, when you're all done reading it, another dependent. Um, so this is a great sentence. It's got a lot of uh, different types of clauses in it, but it's not hard to understand. And then a second example here from uh, George Singleton. Keep a Keep a small can of WD-40 on your desk, away from any open flames, to remind yourself that if you don't write daily, you will get rusty. Love that thought. Okay, now let's talk about sentence length again. Uh, so we don't want to go, we don't want to make any sentence too long uh, without, unless we put some periods, 
or quotation marks in it or semicolons or dashes or whatever you need, but it's very important not to go on for two or three lines without any punctuation because then you're, somebody trying to read it out loud will literally start gasping for breath. You don't want that. Uh, so always make sure you've thought about the, what it's going to be like to read this thing out loud. Now, the second thing to note here is you don't want to have the same, you don't want to have long sentence, long sentence, long sentence, long sentence, long sentence, or, or short, 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 and nothing like that. You want to sort of mix this up. I like to think about a, a fireworks show. You know, if you, fireworks shows, they, they usually have these sort of moments when there's a lot of stuff up in the air, then they'll have some quiet moments when there's just a few things going up, and then they wrap up with a huge sort of uh, finale, right? So I think you should think about your essays the same way. Uh, you can think, think about those short sentences like your uh, little things going up here and there, and then the long ones might be the uh, big show, uh, but you want to mix it up. You know, some short, some long to keep the reader interested. Now when you're putting a sentence together, uh, you always want to pay very careful attention to the way that it starts and the way that it ends, uh, the beginning and the end. So this is a weak start. There are many reasons why blogging is useful. Now, have you ever seen a there are uh, walking down the street somewhere? No, that's because you can't visualize anything when I say there are. It's just sort of empty words. They, they do nothing uh, for your mind. They don't put any image there. So you're better off taking out the there are and there is, it is and so on and putting a solid uh, subject in there instead, like blogging. So blogging is useful for many reasons. If I say blogging, uh, you should hopefully have some idea what I'm talking about. And so it makes it, you sort of jump into that sentence a lot easier. A second example, it is important to proofread. Well, there we've got a, an it uh, that you have no idea what the it is. So again, it's just empty language, just wasted oxygen. I could have rewritten that, uh, rewritten that to say proofreading is important. So it made it shorter, also more direct. Uh, same thing with endings. The policy is one that I don't approve of. Well, you see, I got this weird of uh, stick stuck on at the end. That's a preposition. Uh, you know, again, have you ever seen an of? Oh, look, there's an of over there. Uh, of course not. Uh, so you want to rewrite this so you have a better ending on that sentence. I do not approve of that policy. So consider the difference. The policy is one that I don't approve of. I do not approve of that policy. So hopefully you're able to hear the difference there. Uh, and here's another one. We don't know what the problem is versus we don't know the problem. So thinking about the way the, uh, what's at the end of that sentence? Is it something weak or is it something strong? Uh, now in the middle of the sentence, um, that, you, want the, you want the main idea to be at the start of this thing or at the end. Uh, the stuff in the middle is what the reader will tend to forget. Uh, so put the unimportant stuff there. Now let's look at the example here. Uh, there are a number of policies about smoking that I do not approve of. So that's got a weak start and a weak ending. So we need to fix those. I do not approve of a number of smoking policies. Okay, active versus passive voice. Uh, the active sentence, uh, the subject, the grammatical subject is what is going to be doing uh, the action described by the verb. The pirate drew her cutlass. Uh, subject pirate, uh, verb drew, uh, guess what, it's the subject, the pirate, that is doing the drawing of the cutlass. Uh, passive though, uh, you switch it around, so the grammatical subject is what's receiving uh, the action. So the cutlass was drawn by the pirate. So when should you use uh, active or passive? Uh, if it's important to know, uh, if the person doing it, or the thing doing it is important, then you use the active. So Hank Aaron hit 755 home runs during his career. It's important that you know the person, Hank Aaron, is the one that hit these runs. Wouldn't make any sense if I started this by saying, 755 home runs were hit by Hank Aaron. You know, why do I want to introduce the concept of home runs first? It makes more sense to tell you about Hank Aaron first, so you have him in mind, so that when I tell you about the, the home runs, you know, it's easy to follow. You uh, can comprehend that. Now, passive voice is more useful when you want to talk about the object, what something has been done to. So, President John F. Kennedy was shot today. Obviously, if I started this off by saying, Lee Harvey Oswald shot John F. Kennedy today, 
It doesn't make a lot of sense, especially at the time this happened, because people didn't even know who Lee Harvey Oswald was. They'd never heard of him. He's nobody. Um, on the other hand, everybody knew who John F., uh, John F. Kennedy was, so you start off with him. All right, imagery and metaphor. Now, what you want to do at all times is avoid too much abstract language, those empty words that don't put anything in your head. Um, instead, we want to think about, if you don't have a specific concrete detail that you can put in, maybe you're talking about something abstract. Maybe you're talking about writing. Uh, so you have to think of these, uh, what are, what's called imagery, metaphors, similes, um, almost like poetry, where you're trying to think of something that, whatever this concept is you're talking about, what it's like. Can you think of something that it's like that the reader will be familiar with? So here's some examples. It is important to use images in your writing. Okay, so it broke all the rules we talked about, right? It's got that it is, start. Um, we just say use images in your writing. We don't even, we have no idea what an image is at this point. It's very abstract. So we can supply an example. Some fonts are more formal than others. Well, that's a little bit you know, easier to follow that. You know what a font is, and you probably know that some are more formal than others. Uh, we're still kind of abstract. We need to get into some more uh, specific details here. But it's better than uh, the first one. Okay, so here's some examples of using metaphors and similes. Give your writing bone claws. Use images. So we've got this uh, fun image of the bone claw. I don't know if you like a Wolverine. Uh, but if you do, you probably like that. Aerial font is more formal than Comic Sans, but not as formal as Times New Roman. It's like wearing a shirt and tie with blue jeans and sneakers. Now see there, you might have thought, well, he started off with it is. A little different there because the it, you know what it stands for. It stands for the aerial font. All right, now we get into parallelism. And this is uh, kind of what we were talking about before with accumulative, uh, all these little elements that we can tack on. You want to make sure that the little elements that you tack on all have the same structure it's called parallelism. Think about a, you know, a bridge. You got everything nicely balanced there. You don't want to, you know, it's not like this where the bridge is going to fall apart. The pretzels were too salty, the wings were too spicy, and the root beer was too sweet. So pretzels were too salty, wings were too spicy, root beer was too sweet. Now this is a little bit of a, it's a little bit simple, but you get the idea. Now imagine this, if I said the pretzels were too salty, the wings were too spicy, the root beer was too sweet, and the, you can almost, you don't know what I'm gonna say, but you probably know it's gonna fit that same structure. So that's nice. Uh, when you're listening to a piece of music and uh, you like the song, it's probably because uh, even though you might may have maybe never heard the song before, but you can sort of predict what's going to happen next, and then when it does, it makes you happy. Uh, well, same thing with these sentences. When the writer can set up a certain anticipation, and then it fits what you, what you expected to see, it makes you a little happier. I came, I saw, I conquered. A famous words by uh, Julius Caesar. There's actually a specific term for this sort of thing, uh, but you'll notice there's no I came, comma, and I saw, comma, and I conquered. Sometimes you just want to break the rules, uh, break the rules of grammar if you want to make something more parallel. You know, this is something I want to talk about is, uh, you know, an amateur writer hacks, you know, people that don't really know what they're doing. Uh, they'll look at a sentence and they'll ask themselves, is this sentence correct? Have I done it exactly right according to the school book, the grammar book? Uh, a better writer, you know, an expert writer, someone who writes for a living will look at that sentence and say, they, they don't say, is it correct? They'll say, is it elegant? Is it eloquent? Is it artistically done? Uh, does it have that effect I was going for? So I'm not saying it doesn't matter if it's correct or not, but you know, if you need to break some rules, as long as the sentence, if, if you write a really eloquent and elegant sentence, like I came, I saw, I conquered, uh, nobody's gonna come around and say, well, you know, but you should have put the word and in there. <laughs> well, it probably helps if you're Julius Caesar, right? But um, art before, uh, being correct. All right, number three, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So again, coming back to JFK, you know, it's been a while since we had a really eloquent president uh, that would say things like this, right? But get the idea, you see the structure uh, repeating. All right, so here's a, I love uh, Edward Gibbons, so here's a couple more uh, from him so you can see how this works. 
The various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosopher as equally false, and by the magistrate as equally useful. Here's another example. Uh, when the Athenians finally wanted not to give to society, but for society to give to them, when the freedom they wished for was, when the freedom they wished for most was freedom from responsibility, then Athens ceased to be free and was never free again. So I don't know about you, but I thought about the JFK quote about ask what not ask not what your country can do for you. Uh, when I read this, it seems to have a lot of the same sort of feel to it. And I wonder if JFK might have read uh, Edward Gibbon. You know, back in the day when students were learning how to write or speak, uh, the first part was imitation. So you would take great speeches, you would take great works of literature, and literally write them out, copy them word by word, letter by letter, into your uh, book, your notebook, or commonplaces book. And then only gradually would the teacher start letting you add some of your own ideas in there. Uh, so maybe you had to keep the same structure, but you could uh, sort of like Mad Libs, you know, take out a few verbs, put your own in, take out a few subjects. And then sort of only gradually did you work up to just writing the whole thing yourself. You know, I think that's a very useful technique. Even me, you know, I've been writing for, uh, since I was probably about 11 or 12, and this was something I always got into the habit of, I was always in the habit of doing. If I wanted to, uh, you know, when I'm writing, uh, reading an essay, scholarly work, I'll uh, put an underline or mark by the parts that I think are important, and then later, even, I know I can just copy and paste it, you know, especially if it's an electronic document, I can just copy and paste it, but I find it's better if I, just type it in uh, to my Evernote, you know, word for word, just exactly as it's written there. And something about that process, that imitation, sort of carries over uh, when I'm writing something. I mean, you should really try it, it really works. Okay, let's uh, wrap this up with a, a discussion of tone. Go ahead and put this in with sentences. Uh, so remember, you always need to be thinking about the audience. Uh, for, for me, who's gonna be watching this video? What kind of information do I need to tell you for you to understand uh, my message? Same with you when you're writing an essay. You're thinking about who's going to read this essay. Well, most, most of the time, be your teacher, right? But hopefully the teacher has, also has a bigger audience in mind. Um, you know, I usually try to tell you in the assignments, who do I want you to think about as you're writing this? If you write a letter to your best friend, it's not gonna be the same as if you write the, a letter about the same thing uh, to your mom or to your boss. So you really want to think about that audience. Now, an academic audience, uh, there's a few rules. Uh, one, you need to avoid the word you or talking directly. You don't want to be telling the reader what to do if it's your teacher or professor or two academics talking to each other. Uh, you don't want to use titles like Mr. or Doctor. Just the last name is the convention. And then, uh, most importantly, you want to criticize the arguments that people are making, never the person uh, him or herself. Shouldn't matter who said it, uh, what matters is what do they actually say and what kind of evidence are they using? So here's some examples of emails that I don't think that the students really wanted to be offensive, but it just came across that way. Uh, one, while this class was useless for me, I still managed to enjoy it. So again, this was said to me by a student that really uh, liked me, liked the class. I didn't think, I guess they didn't think it would be relevant for their major. Uh, but it was kind of offensive the way this is worded, right? Saying the class was useless. So that's almost like saying, well, you're useless, I'm useless. And so you want to put a little more thought into that. Uh, two, I've always disliked book learning. I prefer the real thing. Well, again, if you're saying this to an academic who makes a living by uh, reading and writing and uh, transmitting things via text, it's kind of insulting and uh, really just kind of dumb. Uh, three, I need a letter of recommendation ASAP. Well, again, a letter of recommendation is a big favor to ask. I don't get paid any money uh, to write people letters of recommendation. It's just something basically I have to do on my own time. Uh, so it's kind of nice uh, when the person asks me to do it in a polite way. And, uh, and I don't mind doing them, right? But just there's a way to, to ask more politely than this. You know, would you please uh, write me a letter of recommendation? Sure. Write a, write a letter of recommendation for me ASAP. Yeah, I forget you. Uh, number four, are we doing anything important in class on Tuesday? I love this, you know. Uh, question, you know, are we doing anything important in class tomorrow? I have to, you know, I got my brothers coming in, whatever. Well, by saying that, you're insinuating that 
yeah, I mean, this, there's a lot of unimportant things we do in class don't really matter. Again, it's kind of like, you're useless. I'm not getting anything out of this class anyway, so I'll just go do something else instead. Now, I know the student's not trying to be a jerk, because uh, he, he did ask, right? Uh, just poorly worded, poorly thought about. Um, and I could have said something like, uh, uh, do we have anything that has to be turned in in class tomorrow? Or, you know, I have to miss tomorrow. Can someone in the class take notes for me? Something like that. It'd be much better. And then the fifth one here, I'm emailing to correct a number of errors you made in your lecture. <laughs> I've never actually gotten this. I guess it's probably every teacher's worst nightmare, right? So had the facts wrong. Um, but let's just say you saw some, I had a, there was a real uh, character in the class I took in high school, and uh, the guy was always trying to correct the, the math teacher, right? And if he caught her making some type of error, he just really got, he delighted in this, but it was really just rude, and nobody liked this guy. You know, if this were, you and you've noticed something and you thought, okay, uh, I need to say something about this. Uh, there's many ways to be more diplomatic about it. Um, usually what I do when I notice something like this, I'll, instead of just saying you were wrong, or hey, you made an error, I'll uh, ask you if you're sure about something. You know, I say, I saw, you know, I was looking at the, what you put in the lecture, you know, you wrote this, I was, you know, I was just wondering, are you sure you didn't mean this instead? You know, and give the person a little chance to wiggle out of it, right? And say, oh, you know what, you're right. I just, you know, typed that wrong. <laughs> That's a lot nicer um, than trying to say, uh, well, you messed up, you're stupid. Um, also, if you, if, you know, if the person says, no, that's what I meant. That's right, well, the way I've got it, and you know what's wrong. Well, they, they're kind of inviting that, right? But uh, cast a little doubt on it before you just go in um, accusing them of being wrong. Okay, so summing up. Uh, I'm going to sum up the previous, uh, this lecture and the previous one. So remember, a good sentence has good ethos, logos, pathos, and kairos. Ethos, credibility, logos, logic, pathos, emotion, and kairos, timing. So you increase your vocabulary. You know, easier said than done, but if you want to do this, just get in the habit, like I said, if, you write, if you're reading an essay and you see a sentence, uh, maybe you understand it, maybe you don't, but go ahead and write it out word for word. Uh, look up the definitions of the words, learn how to say them correctly, and then really look, uh, focus on how it's being used in the sentence. Uh, three, learn about different types of sentences. Uh, learn about how you can add on to a sentence, improve readability and flow. So you don't want to have too many short sentences, you want to have longer ones, but you still want it to make sense. Uh, four, pay attention to the way the sentences sound when you read them aloud, particularly at the start or end of the sentence. Uh, very important. And then five, be wary of offending your readers with a bad tone. Be very careful, thinking about your audience. You don't want to insult the audience because then you're even less likely to get whatever it was you were asking for. So anyway, I hope you found this useful and uh, we'll wrap up the series next time with a, a brief lecture on paragraphs.